Well, welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library. We're thrilled to see you all here this evening. My name is Joanne Drake, and I am currently serving as the Chief Administrative Officer for the Reagan Foundation. Now, besides our honored speaker here this evening, Ken Edelman, we are privileged to have his wife, Carol, with us, who is a newsmaker in her own right, serving as the director of the Center for Global Prosperity at the Hudson Institute. We also have Ken's sister, Nancy, and I'm told his uncle has arrived. So it's a, a family affair this evening. <laughs> now, as many of you know, Ken Edelman has served this country in many capacities since the late 1960s. He's been with the Department of Defense, he served as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and then as the U.S. Arms Control Director under President Ronald Reagan. He's an author, of course, as well as an expert on William Shakespeare. In the late 1970s, he began teaching the Bard at Georgetown University and then went on to George Washington University. He's even co-authored a book entitled Shakespeare in Charge, and it's billed as a, quote, unique book on Shakespeare's lessons for today's leaders. In 1997, he and Carol founded a company called Movers and Shakespeare. And to this day, they teach critical business skills through Shakespeare's greatest works. Ken can be seen as a guest commentator on Fox News. Many of you may watch that. And he currently writes a column for the Washingtonian. In the Department of Trivia area, Ken translated for Muhammad Ali in the weeks around the 1974 Rumble in the Jungle heavyweight championship fight in Africa. I'm also told today he's about to be the grandfather of a set of twins. <laughs> More family. But we're here tonight to hear about Ken's latest book entitled Reagan at Reykjavik, 48 Hours That Ended the Cold War. As an expert in arms control, Ken accompanied President Reagan on three of his summit trips with Mikhail Gorbachev. This new book, which was just published last week, details the 48 hours in early October of 1986 that were spent in what was then little known Reykjavik, Iceland, when both leaders were on the verge of eliminating all nuclear weapons. Just think about that, all nuclear weapons. Ken has called this historic meeting the weekend that changed the world. I was privileged to also be in Reykjavik during that time. And while I certainly knew it was history in the making, I had very little clue that it was possibly, as Ken has termed it, the straw that broke the communist camel's back. As Ken says in his new book, and he doesn't even use a Shakespeare reference, <laughs> to me, accompanying the delegation as U.S. Director of Arms Control, the weekend in Reykjavik felt less like a typical superpower summit than it did an Agatha Christie thriller. The two principal characters, Reagan and Gorbachev, were vivid. The plot was full of cliffhangers, and the setting, a creaky old house, desolate, reputedly haunted, rain lashing against its window panes, was ominous. Today, I've just learned that Ken has been asked to be the executive producer and consult on a new movie with Michael Douglas, who will play Ronald Reagan, in a movie entitled Reykjavik. I think Ken is taking resumes and headshots for Mikhail Gorbachev. <laughs> Without any further delay, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ken Edelman. Thank you, Joanna. That was wonderful. Thank you, Joanna. That was just wonderful. Joanna didn't mention that I had written five previous books, and uh, I decided after writing them that five was enough for Moses, it was going to be enough for me. Uh, someone said of my previous books, that the most valuable copy is an unsigned copy. There were virtually no unsigned copies, and an unsigned copy with a receipt from a store that someone actually bought it. That was in the, in the rare book uh, section. But I think uh, Reagan at Reykjavik will be a uh, totally different phenomenon for three reasons. Number one is, as Joanne said, it is a great story. It is a, an emotional story. It's for highs and lows. It's with twists, it's with surprises, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that story as we go on. Secondly, it has, uh, as starring role, two of the main characters and most interesting and charismatic men of the 20th century, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. And when you talk about superstars, 
and interesting people. Uh, you can't do any better than Mikhail Gorbachev and especially Ronald Reagan. And if I, I was <clears throat> last night at a book party in San Francisco with George Schultz, who was Secretary of State, and you'll see him with, with us at uh, Reykjavik right here, and very, very helpful and very influential there. Uh, but I was saying last night to Secretary Schultz and to those at the book party that if I had any real wish for this book, it is to show what Ronald Reagan was up to, what he was all about, and what he was capable of. Because what we have, 10 and a half hours of his direct conversation with Mikhail Gorbachev, without notes, without talking points, without staff aid, just back and forth. We have the American notes and we have the Russian notes. And it is stunning how well President Reagan did in a setting like that. So the general image of Ronald Reagan, who doesn't know very much about an issue, who may be you know, a fuzzy at times, who may be disconnected at times. Uh, this, anybody reading this book fairly, now some people will be unfair <laughs> because they can't get over their prejudice at the time of the 1980s, but anybody looking at this fairly has got to think to themselves, this is a terrific performance. This, this is an exceptional way. And don't take my word for it, and don't take uh, your own word for it, but take Mikhail Gorbachev's word for it. During those Ten and a half hours. Gorbachev says to President Reagan at least 11 times that I could count. He says, Gorbachev says to him, I'm making all the concessions and you have made no concessions. And you know what Ronald Reagan says each time Gorbachev complains that? He says nothing. He thinks to himself, that sounds good to me. <laughs> you know, what's wrong with that picture? <laughs> and even in the flight, from Reykjavik to Moscow, when Mikhail Gorbachev, and we have records of that as well, who had been declassified, when Gorbachev is talking to his staff, he is saying, I made all the concessions at Reykjavik, Ronald Reagan made none. And Ronald Reagan was priding himself on being a great negotiator, and he was a phenomenal negotiator. The third thing, after the great plot, after the two characters who are unforgettable, vivid characters, the third is the consequence. I believe, and I make the point in chapter 10, that this was the weekend that ended the Cold War. And I'm going to show you a little about that weekend and walk you through it, and then we'll have some questions uh, as we go along. First thing is, I would tell you that Reykjavik was their second meeting. The first was in uh, Geneva the year before, in 1985. We, in the Reagan administration had spent uh, over six months getting ready for the first summit. This was going to be the first summit of Ronald Reagan, the first summit of Mikhail Gorbachev, the first U.S. summit in six and a half years. After much negotiations, we decided on a neutral country, Switzerland, a neutral city, Geneva, and a neutral place to hold the summit, which was the uh, Aga Khan's Chateau in Geneva. And so there was going to be a level playing field. There was going to be absolutely no host, and everything was going to be equal. We were standing in the foyer of the hall of Aga Khan's great chateau uh, on uh, November, I think it was 15th, 1985. And we were talking to President Reagan. There was a group of six or seven of us. And the Secret Service came up and said, Mr. President, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev's limo is coming around the corner. Ronald Reagan bolts out of the chateau, goes down, greets Gorbachev coming from a big box car that you'll see in a minute, looking a little bit like a mafia leader. Uh, he was head to foot and swaddled in wool. Ronald Reagan had no jacket. This is November in Central Europe, and it's cold. He has no jacket. He is a generation older than Mikhail Gorbachev. He comes out, he looks like a million dollars. And then after shaking Gorbachev's hand, he kind of goes like this, welcome to my abode. So glad you could come. Uh, Gorbachev looks like, thank you. This is very kind of you to invite me. And then, then the most amazing thing happens. As they're going up the steps, Ronald Reagan then at the age of 75, Gorbachev at 54, 
55, as they're going up the steps, Ronald Reagan gently puts his arm under Gorbachev just in case he needs some help getting up that. I'm going to show you that and show you the uh, reaction to that right here. We are waiting for General Secretary Gorbachev to arrive. President Reagan uh, was waiting inside the mansion. He had no coat on. Uh, he was asked, did he want to put a coat on? And while he was trying to make up his mind, the Secret Service announced that Gorbachev was there. So Reagan said, my heavens. He raced out the door without his overcoat, down the steps, and just as Gorbachev's limousine door opened, there was Reagan with his hand out, ready to greet him. Gorbachev was bundled up in a muffler, hat, overcoat. Reagan then put his hand under Gorbachev's arm and assisted him up the stairs. And listen to the Soviet reaction. I felt that uh, we lost the game <laughs> during this first m movement. You can compare it with a chess game. We started with the wrong move. <laughs> and that was, the, that was the reaction of the Soviet spokesman, all right, on that. Uh, and it was just a, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful moment like that. Uh, the uh, summit was scheduled to uh, be a very low-key affair, that um, it was going to be just a meeting. Ronald Reagan, when he announced going to uh, Reykjavik, it was a week before, or uh, 12 days before the summit. Uh, so we had six months to set up the previous summit, 12 days to set up the Reykjavik summit. And all of a sudden, it ballooned like things were. Reagan, when he announced it, said it's not even going to be a summit. It's going to be a meeting to prepare for the real summit that's going to be in Washington at the end of the year. Before long, however, the Iceland government had a preparation committee to set up for the summit. These are the Americans here. Uh, these are the Soviets here. And uh, the Iceland were right here. There were 55 members of the committee on that. While the American delegation was relatively small, the um, Mikhail Gorbachev, here is Reagan, saying in a cartoon, well, Mick, I see you're all set for a low-key, one-on-one, non-summit. Here is Gorbachev, as far as the eye can see, his staff. Uh, Gorbachev brought 300 people with him. We had about 25 or 30 uh, on that. Uh, this is one of my favorite photos. This is the Prime Minister of Iceland. <laughs> this is uh, Tom Brokaw. Uh, the Prime Minister of Iceland is a job that is a wonderful job to have. It's not a very demanding job. <laughs> not much happens in Iceland, and none of it is important, to tell you the truth. <laughs> Iceland is a country of 240,000 people, uh, 120,000 in the capital, and that's it. Uh, and so the uh, summit was coming. This is a gigantic, gigantic affair. Even though it's supposed to be very small, Gorbachev, like I said, brought 300 people. Uh, they said it's not going to be Chevronazi, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, said that one of the reasons that it's going to be quick and everything is that there's not going to be many press people there. Not exactly. By the time the summit opens, there's 3,171 accredited journalists coming to the summit on that. The Prime Minister of Iceland is there, and uh, everybody wants to interview him, of course. And so pro uh, NBC says, you know, what, what time can we bring a camera crew over to, uh, to see you? The uh, Prime Minister's office says, when would it be convenient for Tom Brokaw to do that? And they said, well, you know, 10.15 on uh, Friday morning. He says, that's fine. The Prime Minister will be in the middle of his swimming in the thermal springs, but he can do it from there. So uh, he didn't have a towel or anything else. He does this interview right, uh, right there in his bathing suit. And at the end of the interview, they say to him, well, the summit is going to be in the Hofti House that I'm going to show you in a minute, this house that Joanne mentioned to us that was in the isolated, it was creaky, it was old, and it was said to be haunted. And uh, they asked Tom Brokaw at the end of the interview, asked the Prime Minister right here at Poolside, uh, is this place haunted? And the Prime Minister said, well, you know, my whole family believes in ghosts. And if, if, if there are ghosts in the Hofti House, 
they're most welcome there. So that's, uh, that was his answer on this. Uh, Iceland was very excited about this. This uh, is Miss World, uh, Iceland's own uh, candidate who won Miss World shortly before that. She was on a goodwill tour of Asia and called back quickly for the summit. And she has a Gorbachev Reagan t-shirt right there. I thought that would be great for the cover of my book, to tell you the truth. I thought, I thought it would help sales. And Carol came up with a great title of kind of dieting, uh, sex, cats, and uh, Reagan at Reykjavik, uh, thinking we'd hit all those markets, especially on a search of Amazon or something like that. And uh, the uh, publisher said, well, that's a little too complicated, so we can't put this on the cover. But I think it is, would have made a, just a great cover. Uh, Raisa Gorbachev was in, uh, she was at Reykjavik. Nancy Reagan did not know that she was coming to Reykjavik. They had been together in Geneva and had not gotten along all that well in Geneva when their first summit. Uh, Reagan, the president, and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev did, but the first ladies had some difficulties between them. Uh, unbeknownst to Nancy Reagan, uh, Raisa appears at Reykjavik, and she really had the stage to herself because there was a news blackout on anything having to do with the summit itself. Nancy Reagan wasn't in town, so Raisa was the only game in town. She had the world attention to herself, and boy, did she love it. She changed clothes four times in the first day of the summit, which is a little robust, I thought. And uh, she visited, you know, you've heard of speed dating. This was speed touring. She uh, visited eight sites in seven hours, uh, which were about uh, six more sites than, uh, than uh, Reykjavik really had to offer on that. <laughs> Uh, she went to everything. This uh, is one of my favorite photos. This is the president of Iceland uh, with an unpronounceable name with about 16 consonants and <laughs> no vowels. And she had been the leader of the theater in Reykjavik, the city theater. She was the first elected female uh, leader in the world. And uh, here's President Reagan. This is a courtesy call the day before. I love this photo for several reasons. One is Ronald Reagan's coat. It is just fabulous. And what is, what is amazing about it is that I never saw him wear this coat before and after <laughs> this meeting. And Joanna, did you ever see that? No, okay. So this was taken from some movie set at some point in his life and uh, packed up and just reserved for this one walk and I wreck of it. But uh, I should offer a reward for anybody working in the Reagan Library to find one other photo of him in this fabulous, fabulous uh, coat, an Ulster-style coat with the fur lining on it. What I also love about this is that the president of Iceland said, who ran the local theater and was herself an actor, um, she said, you know, there's no school on teaching us how to be a president. But I think that theater is the best way to prepare because we're talking about relationships, we're talking about society, and we're talking about the meaning of life all day long. Ronald Reagan loved that, hearing that, and he called her my old colleague ever after that time. So whenever he saw her for the rest of their time, uh, he said, there's my old colleague. This is the Hofti House, this wonderful, wonderful house that is just absolutely beautiful. It's isolated in the middle of nowhere on an island in the middle of nowhere. And it was built in 1906. Uh, it is symmetrical, as you can see. It is relatively small compared to uh, the presidential uh, car right there. It was divided in half. We had this parlor up here. The uh, Soviets had this parlor. This was kind of the DMZ of the militarized zone before. The, uh, this is the room where they met, the two leaders met, we'll see that in a minute. And in the basement was the most wonderful part. Uh, I don't know where the ghosts were in this. There were said to be ghosts of a, a virgin girl who drowned off the house, or some Vikings who were uh, incinerated on that property in the 1100 something else. 
Uh, but what was wonderful was the uh, basement, okay? Half the basement was the KGB, half the basement was the CIA and the Secret Service, all right? And they set up all their equipment on that. And they kind of, you know, were right there in a very small place. Uh, there were two bathrooms in the basement. Unfortunately, one was larger than the other. This was unfortunate because both sides wanted the larger loo on that. And so there were discussions, if not negotiations, uh, with Mr. Olofsson, who ran the Hofti House, and he was not used to negotiating between the two nuclear superpowers. He was more of a guy who just take, took care of the house on that. But anyway, they went back and forth and back and forth, and finally the KGB chief said, oh, to hell with it, you know, let's just go on the basis of whatever, you know, works for anybody at the time. So they agreed to that. So uh, from that, we concluded that the main intelligence agencies in the world generally operate on a need-to-know basis. <laughs> but on that weekend in the basement of the Hofti House, it was operating on a need-to-go basis <laughs> on that. And uh, so that is our Hofti House. This is one of the uh, great cartoons of the time. Uh, <clears throat> and it goes that you say, they say that the house is haunted. Uh, <clears throat> you want spooky, check out the place next door. And that's, of course, the arms race uh, right there. On Saturday morning, October 11th, 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan meet. And then they, after posing inside as well as outside, they are in this little room. There is uh, George Schultz, who was with us last night, Mikhail Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan, uh, Edward Shevardnadze, the foreign minister. There is Gorbachev's translator. There is Reagan's translator. He's on the left side of the president because the president has a bad right ear. He's almost deaf in the right ear because a shot went off during a shooting in his Hollywood days, and uh, a gun went off way too uh, close to his ear. And at the corners are the two note takers. That's important, and you can see the leg of one note taker, the Russian note taker right there. The American note taker is right over there. Uh, that's important because, like I told you, we now have those declassified notes for 10 and a half hours of exactly, not ex it's not verbatim, but it's notes of what each of them said for the 10 and a half hours. By and large, when you look at the two sets of notes, uh, they pretty much agree. There are some times when Gorbachev gets a little nasty towards Reagan, because Reagan's repeating his stories endlessly, uh, that, uh, that uh, are in the American notes, but not in the Russian notes. Uh, but you know, aside from a few of those kind of instances, uh, it, uh, it, it's pretty, they pretty much agree. At the end of the first morning in Reykjavik, <coughs> George Schultz asks us to come into the bubble. Now let me explain, every uh, embassy in the world has a bubble. A bubble is a room within a room that's absolutely secure. Its walls are about this thick with plastic and it has kind of Reynolds aluminum uh, around the outside uh, so that nothing can penetrate so it's absolutely secure. And it's on um, some kind of foam or something so it's not even touching the ground. It touches none of the walls in the ground. And in Geneva, when we were negotiating there, we had a bubble where 25, 28 of us could sit around a conference table and discuss the negotiations. Uh, in Reykjavik, the uh, US Embassy was the smallest bubble ever created. And why is this? Because as I said, nothing happened in Iceland, and none of it was ever classified, okay? So all of a sudden, Schultz asked us to go in the bubble so he can tell us what happened the first morning between Reagan and Gorbachev, this, this exact session right here. We're in the bubble, and you have to understand the bubble is very, very small. It has eight chairs, all of them folding chairs, uh, that uh, are not like this, these are much nicer. These are folding chairs that are gray and uh, really cheap, and uh, Walmart would never, you know, deem to sell any chairs like that. And they're jammed together, so we are actually, you know, our hips are touching each other, 
four on one side, four on the other, and our knees are almost touching. At that time, there are big vault-like closing on the bubble, and so there are eight of us in there. Schultz starts to tell us what has happened, and we're going, listening to the secretary, and all of a sudden these vault, these vault like handles open up, and one of these seven foot, four inch Secret Service agents is standing right there, and he says, the President of the United States. So we do what we have to do, we all stand up. We are then belly to belly and face to face <laughs> with everybody. Reagan is right there, and uh, as he's coming in to the bubble, he says, you know, we should fill this up and use it as an aquarium when we're done here. <laughs> Always a creative thinker, even in a time like that. And so now we have a, a little problem, because we have eight seats, and now we have nine of us yeah, right there. And Ronald Reagan was not a small individual, but we're all standing up. So I decided that if I was going to stay, and the fact was, here's the President of the United States, he's going nowhere. Here's the Secretary of State, he's going nowhere. Here's the Chief of Staff of the White House, he's going nowhere. Here's the National Security Advisor, he's going nowhere. And then there's me, okay? So I'm not exactly nothing, uh, but you know, I'm not the top of the food chain at this point either. So I decided if I was going to stay in that bubble, and I decided by God I was going to stay in that bubble, that I had to do something dramatic. So I say right here, Mr. President, I give up my chair, and then I hit the ground. And I am on the ground. Thank God that gigantic Secret Service agent shuts the vault, so we're in right there with the uh, president. And uh, for the next 40 minutes or so, while the president is telling us what happened with Gorbachev and Schultz is telling us, uh, I'm leaning gently against the presidential knees during that time <laughs> on the ground. Right after Reykjavik in 1986, in 1987, the year after, Anglican TV, a British TV, did a kind of reenactment of the uh, Reykjavik summit and they included this scene in that reenactment. Gorbachev surprised the world when he proposed a preparatory summit meeting at Reykjavik with Ronald Reagan. Their talks launched the superpowers on a new path towards the first agreements ever to cut their stockpiles of nuclear weapons. What follows is a dramatization of the inside story of Reykjavik. All right, let's get into the bubble. control. I, I should respond on that. Mr. President, if you start with human rights, for sure you're going to end up with arms control. But if you start on arms control, you're going to stay on arms control, so human rights will get squeezed out. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Ken. George, we can't have just one working party. We want a, a second group on, uh, on the other things, so human rights, Afghanistan, bilateral issues. Uh, I've been told that that was the high point of that actor's career, which uh, you got to feel sorry for the poor guy if uh, that was the high point. That's not the only film, as Joanne told you. Uh, there's going to be a uh, film uh, coming out that's going to be shot later this year that is going to star Christoph Waltz as Gorbachev and, and Michael uh, Douglas as Reagan. And Michael Douglas called me about uh, two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, and said he just loves the book. He uh, is three-fourths of the way through the book, and he recounted scenes from the book that he is so anxious, to, eager to play. And uh, he has told people 
uh, because I've heard it from various people that he is the only actor in the world that can go from Liberace to Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and uh, I, I think he probably is, but uh, he is wonderful. The, um, the downtime, the only downtime in Reykjavik that weekend was at uh, lunch. This is one of the two lunches. Uh, this is uh, Schultz and Poindexter, the National Security Advisor, uh, getting a paper ready to present to us. Uh, this is the President. This is Don Regan, Chief of Staff. This is Max Campbellman, and yours truly right there. Meanwhile, while we're, we're working away, uh, <coughs> Raisa is running around to anybody that will see her. She, this is her second of four outfits that day, and her clad, fox clad, uh, uh, wonderful jacket, and she goes to one of the thermal springs and talks to people there that weren't that very, <laughs> very interested in talking to her. They were interested in just bathing and swimming around, and uh, she's shaking hands with girls wearing bikinis and everything like that. Uh, then uh, this, meanwhile, the gentleman uh, in the room are talking primarily about SDI. They could agree on lowering nuclear weapons, but the president's idea of the Star Wars to protect America, our technological advance, uh, really was uh, the main subject of that weekend. Here is a wonderful uh, cartoon by Jeff McNally, our dear friend, who's no longer with us. And here's Gorbachev saying, <clears throat> and anyway, we don't think such a crazy thing could ever work. And then he says, he has a cigarette in his mouth, you got a light? Reagan says, sure. He contacts an SDI unit, it goes buzz, and he has it. And uh, then Reagan, I love his little face here, and it says this Star Wars stuff drives him nuts on that. <laughs> Meanwhile, on Saturday night, on Saturday night, there was a half protest downtown and half kind of street festival. Uh, Joan ba Baez was there in person and gave a concert uh, that, <clears throat> that night. Meanwhile, we had returned at 8 o'clock at night to the Hofti House, and the President proposed that the arms experts meet. We met from 8 o'clock at night, and we adjourned at 6.20 the next morning. Back in the bubble at 8 o'clock in the morning, I reported to the President that we had made more progress that one night <clears throat> than we had made in the previous seven years of active negotiations in Geneva. We made more progress primarily because the Soviets were really eager to move at that time. Gorbachev really wanted to break the deadlock over nuclear weapons, and he wanted to kill SDI in the process, but he wanted to break the deadlock on nuclear weapons, and he brought along an amazing man who was Marshal Akramayov. And throughout this book, the Akramayov story, I think, is one of the most interesting. Here is a man who was a five-star marshal. Our last five-star was Omar Bradley. Here was a man who we never expected, who came to Reykjavik and uh, just showed up on Saturday night. All of us had heard of him. None of us had ever met him. And he controlled that delegation, and he said he wanted to get things done. And when other members of that delegation started at like 8.06, to spout out their usual rhetoric and usual harangues against the United States position. Uh, one of them, uh, Karpov, was sitting next to him. He did an amazing thing. Akramayev went, looked at him, put his hand on, on Karpov's arm, gave him a stare, and then when Karpov kind of sputtered down from his diatribe, anti-American diatribe, Akramayev looked back at us and said, where were we? on this. And two or three times that night when they again <laughs> loaded and were ready to fire their usual propaganda, he just looked at them and he didn't want any of that. Uh, he was responsible when he came back after the break. We took a break at 3.15 in the morning till 3.30 or, or quarter to four. And he came back and made the concessions on the strategic that would have made uh, Reykjavik at a remarkable summit come what may. The storyline of Akramayoff after that time, a year later, we had a wonderful dinner in Geneva, and he told his story of how at the age of 17 he had joined the Soviet Army, and he was stationed in World War II. He was the last uh, soldier 
who was in World War II, serving in World War II, was still in uniform serving in the Soviet Union at the time of Reykjavik. But in World War II, he was on the road to Leningrad as an 18-year-old. The German Northern Division was uh, her absolutely uh, <coughs> attacking them constantly. And for 18 months, he never left that road. He never went inside a building for 18 months. He was in his pup tent. Uh, the winters got 20 below zero, the Russian winter, and he never left that. He lost his hearing in one ear. He had shrapnel uh, throughout his body, but he made it unlike most of the members of his uh, delegation. Later on, I spent an hour with him. He said his two proudest moments in life were watching Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev sign the arms control agreement, and secondly, being on that road to Leningrad. I spent, in 1989, an hour with him in the Kremlin, in his office right down the hall of Gorbachev, and then found out uh, in September of 1991, buried in an article about the Soviet Union coming apart, in, bar in uh, paragraph six, it said, Marshal Akramayev committed suicide yesterday. He had hanged himself on the chandelier that he showed me in his office, right down the hall from the Gorbachev's office, and he wrote a suicide note, everything I ever stood for is now gone. Uh, he had a funeral two days later. Uh, no official came to his funeral. There was no band playing. This is the most decorated man in Soviet history, the man who had won the hero of the Soviet Union, the chief of staff of the entire armed services of the Soviet Union, five-star marshal. No official came to his funeral, and uh, a week after he was buried, someone came and dug up the grave uh, and stole his uniform and tossed the body aside. Absolutely a tragic ending to a man who had served nobly for what I would consider a ignoble cause. This is Akramayev at Reykjavik uh, meeting the president, and then uh, he left the next day. Sunday afternoon at Reykjavik, we are Standing around uh, the uh, parlor on the second floor, there's Paul Nitze, who is the age of uh, 70 at that time, uh, or a little older, I think, yeah, 75. Uh, he had been at our all-nighter. There is Don Regan, who had not. There is the president in the corner, George Schultz, who had not, and Poindexter, and there, yours truly, Re Ronald Reagan was looking at the last uh, American proposal, and he told us, he said, this is it, because we were by that time in sudden death overtime. The summit was scheduled to end in, at noon. They decided to try once more and to go back that afternoon, and uh, they were meeting right there. R Reagan kept saying, I promised Nancy I'd be home tonight for dinner. <laughs> and I, in trying to be helpful, I don't think was very helpful, but anyway, I tried to be helpful, I said, well, Mr. President, she's going to know where you are, you know. <clears throat> it's not like you're up to no good, you know, stopped at the bar on the way home or anything like that. He said, I know, but I told her I'd be home. And he kept telling us, this is it. He's, we he, uh, got a revised American proposal. We all were there. We said, good luck, Mr. President, as he headed out the door and then down the stairs. And uh, we all knew it was a big moment in history, a big moment in his life, a big moment in uh, the life of America. And so he left there, he shut the door, we said, good luck, Mr. President. And then 10 seconds later, 15 seconds later, he's back in the room. We're saying, yeah, you didn't even have time to go down. I said, what was that all about? He comes back and he says, I just want to make sure that we're doing right by America. I just want to make sure that we're not getting carried away by summit fever that we're doing something in the uh, emotion of the moment that isn't smart for America. And so he calls all of us and he kind of takes a roll call in a circle uh, if all of us are, are uh, comfortable with this position. It was an amazing moment of leadership and when I think back on 27 years, the wonderful traits that Ronald Reagan has to teach leadership, I remember this moment because negotiations can become very emotional Group think can become very pronounced. 
And he just wanted us to kind of calm and pause and think about it and to make sure we were doing right by America. Ron, uh, Reagan uh, offered this to a deal to Gorbachev. Gorbachev wanted to kill SDI and just uh, Reagan would not give up on SDI. So they decided we're not doing it, we're getting out of here. Reagan is very mad right here with Mikhail Gorbachev and according to one account, Gorbachev tries to make nice at the end, says, I don't know what we could have done differently. Reagan puts his hand in his chest and said, well, you could have said yes. He goes back, the Time Magazine cover tells it all, no deal, SDI sinks the summit, and uh, Reagan called it the angriest day of his presidency. And let me just tell you, we all rushed back to the embassy. The president was there on the side, and uh, no one talked to him. He was just furious. He couldn't sit down. He was just pacing up and down. And Jim Kuhn, who you remember, was Reagan's man, you know, that uh, helped him with his coat and his briefcase and everything. He was with Reagan for six years, or eight years. And Jim Kuhn said in oral history that uh, it was the most emotional he saw the president, except for when Nancy had her cancer uh, surgery that day. But he was really very distraught. As they're going out, <clears throat> they drove out to Keflavik, which is the army base. Reagan was scheduled to go two minutes and thank the troops for uh, serving, 3,000 troops. He was angry and just said uh, he was kind of furious. All of a sudden, he gets in front of the 3,000 troops and he becomes Ronald Reagan once again. And he kind of lights up and he <laughs> tells them a story about how he learned how to salute and got permission how to salute, and uh, he is there saluting. <laughs> During the time of writing this book, I, and Duke was wonderful to help on uh, all kinds of documents here at the Reagan Library. I got all kinds of documents at the Reykjavik. Uh, I got all kinds of documents in Washington, I really did. There are 375 end notes, so a lot of well documented. The one document I just found about two weeks ago was in my own file, and that was Ronald Reagan writing me a letter about Reykjavik. So uh, you'd think I would remember this. I really don't. Uh, it was a sweet thing for him to do a week after, and um, he just thanks me for a job well done right there. So the, I think the only document in my book about Reykjavik is Reagan's letter to me about Reykjavik. So, uh, you know, what a doofus I feel like on that. Uh, <clears throat> but it really was awfully nice of him to uh, do that. Now we have... Uh, <laughs> General Secretary Gorbachev. This is in 1987. If you seek peace. Seven, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberalization, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. This is six months after Reykjavik. Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev. Tear down this wall. <laughs> One of my favorite parts of this book is a, a section in the book about that speech. Uh, nobody at the White House wanted him to give that speech. Uh, the National Security Council said it was very provocative. State Department was four square against it. Uh, everybody talked to him. Ken Duberstein, who is deputy chief of uh, staff of the White House, on, in the limo on the way to the speech, says, Mr. President, you know, and he uh, makes an argument again. Reagan is kind of looking out the window, and he says, well, Ken, I, I just think it's the right thing to do. And he keeps looking out the window. And the main objection was not just tear down this wall. The main objection was using Mikhail Gorbachev's name and making it personal, because we were in the middle of the high point of arms negotiations. Everybody thought it would tick him off enormously and be very provocative. So if you notice when Ronald Reagan gave it, he doesn't mention Mikhail Gorbachev's name once. 
he repeats it to make sure that no one missed that. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, you guys don't like me using his name? Fine. Me, <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev. Mr. Gorbachev. There. That's for you. And uh, it really was a uh, wonderful, wonderful moment. We have now the summit in Washington. Uh, the first ladies are right there feeling warm and tender towards each other. <laughs> Showing this is, believe it or not, the welcome ceremony <laughs> of the Gorbachevs coming into town in December of 1987. You can see how warm and wonderful Nancy is welcoming him, right, uh, and how excited they both are to see each other. Uh, on December 8th, they have the signing in the East Room of the White House, and there they are. We have uh, Akra Mayoff there, Secretary Schultz, the Vice President, then the KGB and Secret Service, we're happily dividing the chairs on the second row and the arms control team on the third row. There's Colin Powell, Paul Nitza, myself, Max Kampelman, and others on that. It was a great moment for Ronald Reagan. He enjoyed it, and uh, he was signing. It was the most sweeping arms control agreement in history. The next year, 1988, uh, Reagan goes to Moscow. I love this picture, under the hammer and sickle, under the six-foot bust of Lenin and he goes from place to place to place preaching the virtues of free enterprise and freedom. <laughs> and it was an amazing visit. Every night they had a certain ritual. Reagan was out like an Old uh, Testament prophet preaching the values of freedom and free enterprise, and every night the spokesman would denounce whatever he said <laughs> that day, sending a signal from Gorbachev, this is totally improper to do, and that would just gin up Reagan even more on that. <laughs> the last night of the four-day summit, uh, he is exhausted. It's been constant movement. They have a state dinner, then they have the Bolshoi Ballet, and then they're in Red Square. Uh, a reporter sees him there and says, Mr. President, after all you've done, why, why are you here? It's, you know, it's midnight or something. And he said, well, we're leaving tomorrow, and I didn't want to leave town without Nancy seeing this site. Uh, the next year, in November, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is greeting in East Germany uh, Hanukkah, the East German president, uh, with a little bit of a more passionate kiss than you needed to on comradely, uh, comradely association. And in November of that year, the wall fell. Rostopovich runs there, flies there immediately, takes his cello, sits uh, right against the wall, and plays Bach for unaccompanied uh, cello uh, to express his profound feelings at that event. Uh, a month later, uh, in his last year of life, uh, Leonard Bernstein comes and uh, <coughs> has an orchestra conducted, an orchestra with East Germans, West Germans, French, British, Americans, and Russians, and he has the ode to joy. In December of 1991, an amazing thing happens. The flag comes down from the top of the Kremlin, and this is <clears throat> on a flight to Detroit to accept the Republican nomination. Reagan is asked, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be president, Mr. Pre Ron? And without a minute of hesitation, he says to end the Cold War. By that time, he had worked out how it's going to end. We win, and they lose. On Christmas Day, 1991, the flag came down, ending the Cold War. We won, and they lost. Ninety-four. There's a beautiful letter that Joanne helped us with. November 5th, 1994. My fellow Americans, I have recently been told that I am one of the millions of Americans who will be afflicted with Alzheimer's disease. Unfortunately, as Alzheimer's disease progresses, the family often bears a heavy burden. I only wish there was some way I could spare Nancy from this painful experience. When the time comes, I am confident that with your help, she will face it with faith and courage. In closing, let me thank you, the American people, 
for giving me the great honor of allowing me to serve as your president. When the Lord calls me home, whenever that may be, I will leave the greatest love for this country of ours and eternal optimism for its future. I now begin the journey that will lead me into the sunset of my life. I know that for America, there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Thank you, my friends. Sincerely, Ronald Reagan. That's in 1994. And then in 1996, I go on the 10th anniversary of the uh, Reykjavik summit. I go through all the sites, including at Hofti House, the bubble, and I am so emotionally carried away by what happened there. And remembering 10 years back, I have a, an experience like I've never had before walking through these sites. And I walk into a drugstore, I buy a postcard that's just like this, and I address it to President Ronald Reagan, even though he's deep into Alzheimer's at that time, and uh, the Reagan Library. And I said, Mr. President, I'm here on the 10th anniversary, and I just want to tell you, uh, I look back at the wonderful, wonderful job you did 10 years ago uh, for America and how very proud I was to serve you. I was lucky enough <clears throat> a week la later to tell Nancy Reagan, Mrs. Reagan, about that postcard when there was a 10th anniversary uh, conference about Reykjavik in, um, <clears throat> actually here in the Reagan Library and the night before there was a dinner at the hotel. Uh, in 04, almost 10 years ago, next month is going to be uh, the anniversary on June 5th of the President's death. There's an outpouring of emotion uh, in uh, America for him. I love this picture, two firemen as the cavalcade, the funeral cavalcade goes underneath the flag. In California, <laughs> when the body's brought back here, there are firefighters and policemen uh, above a viaduct. Uh, this is Mrs. Reagan right outside on uh, this before the casket is lowered. And Carol and I were very, very lucky to be at the official funeral in <coughs> the National Cathedral and uh, be honored to be there. But the most wonderful, wonderful moment of that wonderful week called, Mor to me, Morning in America with a U, that wonderful moment happened the day before that uh, funeral at uh, National Cathedral, when unannounced and unanticipated, Mikhail Gorbachev flies into what is now called the <coughs> Ronald Reagan Washington National Airport. He goes right over to the Capitol where the body is lying in state. He is recognized and allowed in uh, in front of the ropes right there. And he stands there for a minute of contemplation, and then he approaches the casket and as he said afterwards, he patted it, stood there for a minute, and then he started rubbing the red and white stripes of the flag of the 40th President of the United States. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Let's have a few questions, and then I have a, a going away treat for you, a real treat, OK? But open it up for questions first. Yeah, please. Was any consideration given to calling the book uh, 48 Hours That Won the Cold War? <laughs> uh, good idea. Where were you when we were naming the book? <laughs> because it was quite clear, as I said, in the 1970s, and that's one of the wonderful parts about doing a book like this, it is so wonderful being back, and I say this in the acknowledgement, it was great being with Ronald Reagan the first time around. It's even more wonderful being with him the second time around because you see things that you didn't see before. I didn't know about that conversation in the plane going to the Detroit for the Republican nomination where Stu Spencer says, Ron, why do you want to do this? Why do you want to be president? He says, to end the Cold War. I didn't know that he started in the 1970s saying, I know how it's going to win, end. We win and they lose. I never knew this. I didn't know, I couldn't see then the four parts of the strategy that he had laid out. SDI, deep reductions in nuclear arms, a delegitimization campaign saying communism will end up on the ash heap of history, and <clears throat> calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, 
focus of evil in the modern world, uh, and um, the overall restoration of American power and American prestige. I, I never saw that. And now, the second time around, I can see that, and it's a beautiful strategy. It's just wonderful. Other questions? Yeah, please. Yes, I'm, I'm curious about this movie coming out with Michael Douglas. Yeah. I, I, in light of what he told you on the phone, do you feel confident he's going to be fair towards uh, President Reagan? That's a good question. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> I am uh, assistant, no, what am I, executive producer of the movie. And um, I said in that conversation, I have also told the director uh, to be on that. I told the producers on that. Really, it has to be accurate. And really, the story is wonderful enough in itself. You don't have to exaggerate. It's there. And Michael Douglas totally agreed. And he started recounting some of the scenes, including the bubble scene. He loved that. And three or four other scenes that are not in the script right now, but I don't think he paid much attention to the script right now. It needs to be redone. And uh, I can't blame him because my book wasn't available when the script was done. So I think my big pitch is, and I tell everybody who will listen, the story is good enough in itself. If you did the Akramayoff story throughout, it's wonderful. If you did the Raisa and Nancy story throughout, it's wonderful. You did the, just the <coughs> two leaders talking back and forth and back and forth. Their, their talk is, is wonderful. They're not just talking about weapon system. All of a sudden, Reagan veers off on the relative merits of communism and um, democracy, okay? And he starts off in a way that no other president would ever start off. He says, you know, there's been a lot of mistrust between us, and we gotta clear up that mistrust. All right, so far, so good. He says, you know, each of us have reasons to mistrust the others. So far, so good. He says, but ours are totally justified, and yours are not. <laughs> I mean, if you were there, and you were Gorbachev, or a translator, you'd say, whoa, where did this come from? And he does it in this nice, gentle way. Gorbachev must have been, whoa, you know. I've never, you know, usually it's, there's merit on both sides, and let's, you know, and harump, 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 back and forth, but he doesn't. And he goes on and on and on about uh, the repression of the Soviet system. And you know what? Mikhail Gorbachev, for whom I have a lot of admiration, and I say in there he was a great man of history, he has lousy answers for it. And I say in there, you know, even the leader of the system can't come up with good reasons for this system. And it had lost its legitimacy. And the arguments that Gorbachev makes on his system, just talking the two systems, are the weakest at Reykjavik, and pretty pathetic at that. He must know that he has just a very bad argument to make, and he makes it as best he can, but it's not very good. What else? Yeah, please. Um, you mentioned the strategy and the out, this marvelous outcome. In light of that, I'd like to know your thoughts and concerns about what's happening today. Yeah. I don't think that there's a return for the, to the Cold War today. Uh, for one thing, the, uh, <coughs> Russia is, our, the Russian army is one-fourth the size of the Soviet army. For another, the Russian nuclear arsenal is less than a fourth. Reykjavik started a steep decline in nuclear weapons on both sides, attributed to Reykjavik uh, itself. Uh, number three, the uh, Russian economy is about the size of Italy's economy and going down. And Russia has no overall ideology that's attractive to anybody in Cuba or in Angola or Cambodia. It's Russian nationalism. And that's fine for Russian nationalists, but it's not very inspiring for anybody else around the world. So Russia is a danger to its neighbors. It's a danger to the international system because of uh, its invasion of its neighbors, but it's not a danger to the whole world. When Nancy, my sister, and I were going to Bryn Mawr Grammar School on the south side of Chicago, on Tuesday morning at 10.30, we would be, <laughs> the air raid sirens would go off, we were marched down the hall, and we put our heads in our hall locker, okay? I remember asking, I remember asking Miss Mulroy, 
how do you know that the Russians are going to launch missiles at us on 10.30 Tuesday morning, <laughs> Chicago time? And she said, oh no, the principal had worked all that out. And I said, okay. And I had one other question. I said, my head is in the locker, but my fanny's still in the, in the hall. Won't my fanny get fried? And they said, no, no, she's thought of that too. The principal had thought of that. So we were, we were safe on that. Kids today can't believe that we put our heads in the locker. They can't believe that dads made fallout shelter in the basement of that. They can't believe dramas like, you know, the day after or uh, on the beach or about uh, nuclear annihilation. And, uh, you know, in that book it says, as bad as conditions are today, they were not existential on the whole um, existence of the United States and of mankind. And in that day it was. Other questions? Yeah, please. I presume Brad Pitt is going to play you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can get this actor back. <laughs> As I understand it, he needs a revival of his, uh, of his career. Any last question? And then I'll give you your treat. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would there have been one in Benghazi? Uh, it wasn't the embassy there. It was a consulate. And so it would be in uh, the capital of Libya, but not, not in, the, uh, you know, in another city of there. So it would have been Tripoli, but not there. So it's in the capital right there. OK, anything else? All right, here is your treat. And <laughs> I'm excited to give this to you. <laughs> and it is parts of the 1981 inaugural address. And we were there on the mall, and I think Nancy and Alan were with us on the mall when Reagan was uh, inaugurated. And that night, it was so cool, because Carol and I were giving a dinner party that night, a black tie, and we had Don Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney and our whole gang uh, there for our dinner in 1980, and it was so cool because I had to leave my own dinner party early. Uh, I had been asked by the Reagan team to go to Wiesbaden to greet the ex-hostages because Jimmy Carter had asked Reagan in the afternoon, could he take an Air Force plane, I think it was the one in the pavilion right here, over to uh, Wiesbaden and, uh, you know, uh, <coughs> welcome the uh, ex-hostages there that were released, of course, the afternoon of Ronald Reagan's inauguration. This are parts of the Reagan inauguration, and someone was very clever, and they put nice pictures to it. But these are words of Reagan in his 1981 inaugural address. If we look to the answer as to why for so many years we achieved so much, prospered as no other people on Earth, it was because here in this land, we unleashed the energy and individual genius of man to a greater extent than has ever been done before. Freedom and the dignity of the individual have been more available and assured here than in any other place on earth. The price for this freedom at times has been high, but we have never been unwilling to pay that price. Those who say that we're in a time when there are no heroes, they just don't know where to look. The sloping hills of Arlington National Cemetery with its row upon row of simple white markers, bearing crosses or stars of David, they add up to only a tiny fraction of the price that has been paid for our freedom. Each one of those markers is a monument to the kind of hero I spoke of earlier. Their lives ended in places called Bellow Wood, the Argonne, Omaha Beach, Salerno, and halfway around the world on Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Pork Chop Hill, the Chosin Reservoir, and in a hundred rice paddies and jungles of a place called Vietnam. Under one such marker lies a young man Martin Treptow, who left his job in a small town barber shop in 1917 to go to France with the famed Rainbow Division. There on the Western Front, he was killed trying to carry a message between battalions under heavy artillery fire. 
We're told that on his body was found a diary. On the flyleaf, under the heading, My Pledge, he had written these words. America must win this war. Therefore, I will work, I will save, I will sacrifice, I will endure. I will fight cheerfully and do my utmost as if the issue of the whole struggle depended on me alone. We must realize that no arsenal or no weapon in the arsenals of the world is so formidable as the will and moral courage of free men and women. It is a weapon our adversaries in today's world do not have. It is a weapon that we as Americans do have. Let that be understood by those who practice terrorism and prey upon their neighbors. As for the enemies of freedom, those who are potential adversaries, they will be reminded that peace is the highest aspiration of the American people. We will negotiate for it, sacrifice for it. We will not surrender for it now or ever. We are Americans. It's a great way to remember Ronald Reagan. And uh, let me just say, uh, I just hope you enjoy this book, reading this book as much as I enjoyed writing this book. And thank you very much. <laughs>